Alright guys, this is my update on the BYD Seal Premium. Now I've been driving this car for almost 5,000 kilometers and I have signed up for Uber to actually drive as many Ks as I can in this car in a short period of time because I wanted to check whether it's doable, one on Uber and it will still make sense financially. Two, I wanted to get people's impressions and feedback on the car, but then also three, I just wanted to see how annoyed I would get with a lot of kilometers in a short period of time and the only way to really rack up that many Ks and get yourself into many different environments and scenarios is by driving Uber. So that's what I've been doing on the weekends for the past few weeks, as well as doing my daily commutes and everything around town with the car. Safe to say, I have definitely put it through its paces. Big shout out to the guys at Share EV. Now I am paying and renting this car, so it's not a promoted or sponsored review uh, or feedback. Uh, but check them out. They made it easy for us to basically request for them to go and buy the car. We'll rent it and review it and then they'll put it in their rental fleet for rideshare drivers and accident replacement vehicles. So make sure you check them out, shareev.com.au. They've got a, a bit of a fleet here in Brisbane as well as several other cities around the country including Melbourne, Sydney and Perth. Now back to the BYD side of things. So this particular car was really intriguing for me. I did 95,000 kilometers in the Tesla Model 3 last year. And as much as I loved the ease of ownership for that particular car, there were a few quirks that really annoyed me. A few other things that I thought could have been better developed. Suspension around Brisbane was absolutely horrible because it was very rough and tough. And it was like driving a go-kart on a normal road. The handling was fantastic because it drove like a go-kart on normal roads and was very engaging and dynamic. But the real pain of it was when you just wanted to cruise or drive around, you felt every single bump around town. And that's just not what you want in a car that is a $60,000 car. So when I heard that the BYD was bringing out their seal, I wanted to test out whether there was any advantage in going the premium option, which is this one, which has a 630 kilometer range from an 82 kilowatt hour battery pack versus the Tesla Model 3 standard range that I had last year, uh, which had a 410 kilometer range from a uh, 55 kilowatt hour battery pack. You'll have to forgive me, I'll correct it in, in the comments. Uh, I've, it's been a little while since I've been in that car. But what I will say is the additional range is an absolute godsend from a ease of and practicality point. So because I, I didn't need the additional top up every few days, I've gone sometimes a week without having to charge the car, which is fantastic. But it's also made me think, I never really was inconvenienced by having to go home, plug in the Model 3 last year and plug in every day. So what I would recommend is test out the standard dynamic version as well as the premium and see which of the two you prefer. I'm gonna request a dynamic from the guys at BYD, so I'll see if, we, if they'll lend us one for a review, because I'm really curious to see whether you can actually live with that car just as easily as you can live with the premium version that has the 630 kilometer range. Now, on average, I've achieved 550 to 600 kilometers in terms of actual range with this car, and that's in part because, one, aerodynamically, They've done a good job and it looks gorgeous. But two, it's just really efficient on the highway. Um, so on the highway, I can get efficiency as low as 11.8 and 11.2 kilowatt hours uh, per 100 kilometers. Um, and around town, it will hover somewhere between 13 and 15, depending on what I'm doing. So not too dissimilar in that capacity to the Tesla Model 3 that I had. In terms of styling, this is just absolutely gorgeous. Everywhere I go, people will look at the car. Um, and that's one thing that definitely um, you know strikes me with the BYD seal it is it is a very good looking car and very well designed uh, from that perspective now let's talk about the couple of things that I didn't like so bear with me while I open the, the front boot or the frunk now one of the things that I have missed from the Tesla Model 3 is that BYD has gone with a much smaller cavity here. Now I have some sunshades for the glass roof that's, that's inside, but this is the cavity that you get here. So it's not all that big for the space that's underneath here. 
In the Tesla Model 3, I used to be able to fit a carry-on suitcase in here. That's not the case with this particular car. You're gonna be very much using this for shopping or just additional storage or any charging infrastructure that you might have that you need to bring with you. Um, sorry, charging accessories, not the infrastructure. Uh, and that, that's kind of what you're gonna have fitted there. Windscreen washer fluid top up area is right there. And that's kind of all you have underneath here and a lot of plastic. So it would have been nice to see a slightly bigger front or front boot uh, because that was really convenient in the Model 3. The other thing is it would be nice to have the release on the key. Um, I know that the BYD has an app. It's just from a key perspective, if I've got to carry the key anyway, it would have been nice to have a button on the key just to pop the front boot just as easily as it was to do that in the Tesla Model 3 from the app. Moving around to the side. Styling has been fantastic. The door handles have been very, very easy to get people in and out of the car. None of my friends have had to question how do you open the, the door handle? Because as much as the Model 3 door handles were amazing in terms of being a like a fighter jet style push and pull, uh, a lot of people didn't know how to use them. So these just pop out the minute you press the unlock button and they fold flush when you lock the cars nice and easily. So. It's nice and flush. If we were driving, they would also retract so that you have a nice aerodynamic surface as well. So once again, a very simple, very easy design for this door handle, similar to the Model S in the early days versus the Model 3. Now from an Uber perspective, this was interesting because I drove a Model 3 for a while and that was the big thing. How do you get in? How do you get out? Because it was just not traditional in the functionality and it got really tiresome when I was testing that car out for a long-term review on Uber on how that would actually function. So. That's that part there. Moving into the back of the car. Now this is the space that everyone gets in and where I've had the most amount of feedback. Now, legroom, as you can see, is tremendous. The front seat is actually in the convenience feature setting, which means it's the whole way back currently to where it would normally be versus where I actually would sit. So if I'm sitting in the front, it's actually slightly forward. You still have some pockets and holders all through here, but it's a very spacious rear seat and a lot of people comment as to just how much room there is in the back. They love the glass roof and other side to that is they love all the soft touch materials and just all the nice finishes along the doors and they're holding up relatively well given that this car has now close to 8,000 kilometers uh, on top of the original kilometers that it had after I picked it up and rented it from these guys. So it's very impressive from that side and it has a coat hook just located on both of these two doors to make it super easy for people to put a coat on there uh, if you are somewhere where it's not Queensland and you're not dying in humidity every day. So let's check out the back. Now with the back, one of the great features is that it's actually wide enough and tall enough to fit two suitcases in the back without too much trouble. In the Model 3, it was kind of a, a tight fit for anything bigger than two medium-sized suitcases. However, the Model 3 did have one advantage, and that was this space underneath here was actually big enough for a carry-on suitcase. Now, in this car, you could get a carry-on duffel bag, but you could, definitely couldn't get a carry-on suitcase in here. And it's quite full with all of your other charging gear as well. So you're limited on, a little bit on the room there. But overall, it's a pretty reasonable boot space. Given the amount of additional space there is in the back seat, would it be nice to maybe just make this a little bit deeper or a little bit further forward so that you could have a little bit more space in the boot and then it would just would have been a perfect car. So that's probably the only commentary I have on this, but boot going up and down, it's seamless. It's nice and easy and zero issues. Now charging, as you can see, we've been charging here while we've been filming this review. We came here at 34%, we filmed another video. We're now at 68%, we're down to 30.4 kilowatt hour speeds in terms of the charging. And that's a mixture between the car and also the charging station here. This is actually one of the older Queensland electric super highway chargers. And being tritium, they are a little bit hit and miss with their reliability and speeds, but it's doing all right. The one thing I'll say is I've tested this car for the first 2000 Ks as if I was publicly charging and I had no infrastructure at home. Now, I don't know if I would recommend the car to someone that doesn't have the ability to charge at home where it's nice and easy to reverse the car in or pull the car in, plug it into your electricity at home and experience a more affordable charging rate. A lot of these charges around Brisbane and around Australia in general have started increasing in price quite a bit 
uh, as electricity prices go higher and it's now getting more and more expensive to charge. So at some of the charges on average, it's been between 50 and $60 for me to do a 5% to 100% charge on this car, which has an 82 kilowatt hour battery to do 600 kilometers of driving. Now, in a conventional hybrid vehicle, that wouldn't have taken anywhere near as long and would have been much quicker and much easier. So that's where I would talk about pricing as maybe something that you need to consider a little bit differently. We've talked about fast charging, let's talk about home charging. So if you had this car and you were able to charge at home, this is a fantastic way to save money on your daily commute and have a very comfortable car still. So on average at home, you can experience some discounted electricity rates from some electricity providers that will give you a rate of as low as eight cents a kilowatt hour charging between midnight and 6 a.m., which means you could charge this car for around $6 to $8. So depending on how, how much charge you had left when you go home, but somewhere between six and $8 is what it would cost you to do 600 kilometers of driving. Now. If you have a standard electricity rate, so me at home, I charge with Amp Charge, uh, sorry, Ampol, uh, with their electricity plan, I get 26 cents per kilowatt hour. So that means that this car will cost me somewhere between 15 to $20 to charge to get that 600 Ks, depending on how much charge I have when I get home. So a fantastic way to save money on those longer trips, but definitely when you're out and about, if you're relying just solely on public charging, it may not be the best option for you. So with that, let us know in the comments what you think about the charging options, what charging option you would use, and uh, overall, if it's a car that you would consider. The things that I wanted to point out, and this is a very picky side of things, and it's because I'm trying to be as transparent as I can in this review, right? So there's not many things that have actually troubled me about this car. It doesn't make any squeaks, it doesn't rattle, the build quality is incredibly good. Um, it's way better than the Model 3 was. The Model 3 squeaked and rattled and made all sorts of noises. Even the center console doesn't really move and doesn't really make any noise. So great job by BYD at building a car that feels every bit premium for a brand that many won't consider to be a premium brand. The carpet, however, is the one thing where I would highly recommend that you get yourself a set of floor mats. Now, whether they're genuine floor mats or whether they're the molded rubber mats that you can buy. Um, I'm waiting for a custom set to be made. So that's the only reason I don't have mats in here and I apologize that at the moment uh, the carpet is not so clean. I've experienced a bit of wear and tear that I've started noticing on the driver's side around where my foot would normally rest, uh, just underneath the brake pedal. Now my shoes are standard sneakers. So they're, not, they're not work boots, they're not high heels. If you're wearing work boots or high heels, you would probably experience a lot more aggressive wear and tear in such a short period of time. By contrast, the passenger section has next to no wear and tear. And that's the, the bit that gets used very infrequently. Um, so you can see that it's just a little bit of wear on a daily basis for the driver's side is going to give you a very different um, experience when it comes to how that car actually goes. Now, out of all the cars that I've ever owned or reviewed or even experienced uh, used vehicle reviews, I've never seen floor like the floor itself or the carpet wear out so quickly in a brand new car. So that's the one thing I'd, I'd recommend to get yourself a set of floor mats. Um, I don't have any suggestions other than the ones that I'm waiting to get, but I haven't personally tried them. So I'll put a link to that website on the, in the comment section, but wait for the review uh, that I do on those floor mats. So that's basically it. All right, so what has it been like to actually live with this car on a daily basis and to drive the car? Well, it's been really comfortable. The seat is far more comfortable and more supportive than the previous Model 3 that I had. And in terms of the display, having the heads up display and having the main centered display here is super informative and very, very helpful in being able to just see what you're doing. The center display over here, Apple CarPlay and Android Auto compatible makes it super, super easy to just plug my device in and start experiencing what I need to experience when it comes to maps, when it comes to podcasts, audio, anything that I need, it's been pretty good there. One of the other great things that I really like about the BYD versus the Model 3 that I previously had after this many Ks is the screen itself has a number of different camera modes, including a 360 degree view, which 
just makes it really easy to park and, and navigate some of the trickier parking scenarios around town. Um, and it's still disappointing that in 2024, the Model 3 doesn't come with a front camera, um, despite having all of the other cameras around. Now, one thing I will add to that is the one thing that I'm missing quite a lot that I got really used to in the Model 3 is when you indicate the Model 3 on the center display will throw up a fairly chunky sized image of the side that you're turning or indicating on for the blind spot camera that shows you that blind spot area. That's actually really handy and as I've been driving this and I don't have that anymore, you definitely notice that you got used to it and it was very handy to have. So that's one thing there to Tesla that, you know, maybe could be a feature that BYD can add. The other thing that I would say as well is with this particular car, the app functionality is not as seamless as the Model 3 and the Tesla app in general is just fantastic in being able to schedule things and just being able to use the car without having to carry keys. It's the, the best thing about that particular car and it's um, the one thing that I, I definitely think is, is very valuable. Uh, now, the beeps and the buzzing that all the journalists and everyone has been complaining about. So, you can turn off quite a few of those. The main beeping that actually comes is telling you the intelligent speed um, limit alerts and that's basically the cameras reading the speed sign in the area and telling you that you're doing 62 in a 60 zone and that's when it starts beeping. So you can actually turn that off. It will still display the speed. It will just turn off the audible warning. So that's in the settings and you can easily get that um, changed. So you're not really going to have to worry too much about some of those kind of pesky things. The one disappointing thing is that the lane departure alert and the lane keep assist is still very aggressive in the way it will try to maneuver you uh, away from what it perceives to be a, a dangerous situation. But I've had it trigger when I've just been on a normal road and a car has been coming the other direction. There's been a couple of times where the system has pulled to the left and I've had to avoid and pull the other way. So just something to let you know there as well. So past that, uh, let's show you the camera system. So with the reverse camera, as you can see, it's pretty clear in the display it's a sizable screen which means you're not bunching this together and you're getting a very nice bird's eye view over here because the car actually has a 360 degree camera system including the front camera you will have plenty of visibility so you can also opt for a 3d mode which gives you a full wraparound of the car including old mate going past with his kid and to make sure that you've parked in the lines now once you get out of this, you can change the views, so you can change the side cameras, you can look at the front camera, the back camera, you can have an overview of just the sides, and you can just look at the front. So plenty of usability for the camera system. When you do put it in reverse, the beauty is it also gives you movable guidelines. So you're gonna see that the lines actually change to show you where you're gonna end up to hopefully help you park a little bit straighter and have just a little bit of an easier experience parking up. The cool thing as well is this actually offers a screen that will actually move. So if you wanted to rotate the screen and have a different view and have three positions for that camera, you can definitely have that as part of your settings or even just rotate it quickly when you're about to reverse or when you're about to park and then put it back to normal. Personally, I haven't used that function. I've actually left it in this mode unless I've been showing friends or uh, people that have been in the car with me. Uh, that you can move the screen. So that side of it there. The dash I really like because the soft touch materials throughout the dash make it very nice and, and premium in terms of the feel. Um, and there's no real noise or rattles or, or squeaks or anything that come from that. So it's been fantastic there again. Um, and the rear vision mirror is auto dimming as well. Um, so that's been quite handy. The one thing though, however, sometimes it can be a little bit oversensitive. Um, that was the beauty of the Model 3 that I previously had where I was able to deactivate um, the, the auto dimming and it would just be a normal mirror when it needed to be a normal mirror. So just a little functionality that hopefully BYD can add in the future. Um, a couple of other things that I really like about this car is when you go into the home settings and you go into your air conditioning mode, everything is pretty easy to lay out and there's even smart air and the smart air actually moves the vents left and right up and down to just keep the air flowing in all different positions rather than having just you know the one position that you have to physically move and unlike the Tesla where it was just always a pain to try to get it to point right at my face on longer drives when I needed to have that fresh air hitting my face uh, this actually does a pretty good job at that so 
again, just another tick for BYD. And having ventilation for the seats has been an absolute godsend here in Queensland recently. And it's as simple as swiping that or swiping that to put it onto heating mode. The one downside is there's no rear seat uh, heating in this particular car, which was a handy feature for some of my passengers in the Model 3 previously. There is an air purification uh, mode as well. So if you were in a more, um, uh, sorry, if you were in a more polluted city uh, with poor air quality, you can actually filter the air and improve the air quality um, at the same time as well. So that is a really handy feature for those of you watching this video outside of Australia. Uh, the two charging pads at the top here have been pretty awesome. And the great thing is, uh, for whatever reason, the Model 3 never used to charge um, with my phone in the case, even though this is a MagSafe charging case. Um, so in the BYD, that plugs in and charges all the time and you can have two devices fast charging as well. So that's just been another little quirk that I've really enjoyed. So um, cup holders have been in logical places and the cool thing is that they're adjustable and the armrest is in a place where it's just very comfortable. So overall, the driver's been very, very comfortable and I would highly recommend this car for anyone looking at a vehicle. Cup holders have been in logical places and the cool thing is that they're adjustable and the armrest is in a place where it's just very comfortable. So overall, the driver's been very, very comfortable and I would highly recommend this car for anyone looking at a vehicle. So there you have it, guys. Those are my impressions of the BYD seal so far. After a tremendous amount of driving in this, several charges, both publicly and privately, and a lot of people that have gone in the car and given me their feedback on some of the features that they like with the car, as well as some of the features that maybe they think could be improved. So definitely would recommend go have a drive, test drive the BYD if you need it for a bit longer, hit the guys up at Share EV if you're in Brisbane, rent the car from them for a week, a couple of days, whatever it might be, get a feel for how the car is gonna fit into your life and how you're gonna use the car because as great as some electric cars can be, they're not gonna fit into everyone's life as seamlessly as they might have into mine. Public charging, as I said, depending on what cost you have access to in terms of your electricity, public charging may be a little bit cost prohibitive for you, but the car itself is just fantastic in terms of every other um, way. I'm gonna hit up BYD and try to get a Dynamic, which is the base model with a, sm a much shorter range, because I actually think that that could be the car that everyone should be buying instead of the higher spec models for everyday use around most of our cities. So leave your comments in the comment section, ask any questions, what you wanna know about the, the car that we didn't cover off in this particular review. And I can't wait to speak to you guys next time about with some more exciting information on some of our EVs that we're reviewing.